Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to demonstrate the execution of three attack trees we have built for the Quicksort architecture. Um, at this stage, uh, all I know about the system is a domain name, quicksight.com. I do not have any knowledge of the ground system assets or the user interfaces or the users. Also, I'm a thousand miles away from the software and hardware. These scenarios are executed fully remotely with no physical access to the hardware or the software. We start with simple, but uh, we start with a simple but very real scenario. Here we have the first attack tree for a denial of service scenario, where my objective is to cause annoyance to the system operator or the customer. The attack tree here is built using the methodology that was described previously. This method forces you to think more directly uh, from an attacker's point of view and consider the steps an attacker would take to compromise the system. So here at the top of the uh, tree is my goal, uh, which is uh, you know, to create a, a denial of service or an annoyance to the customer. Um, I've listed a sub goal for each of the key chain steps here. It's easy to see that there are many ways to achieve the goal. I'm just demonstrating one of the many ways. So overall, what we want to do uh, is first gather enough information about the system assets and users in the recon step, then attempt to fish legitimate users in order to steal the credentials, uh, then uh, get access to the user interfaces uh, for the quickset.com, uh, which were hopefully give us access to the CubeSats and then execute some steps to create annoyance. So when you create a tree such as this, it is not always the case that these steps would be successful. So as an attacker, you may have to test out multiple different ways of getting access to a system. I'm showing you one that worked for me. So most of the vulnerabilities I demonstrate here are real vulnerabilities in the system, which were found while preparing for this demo. Because CubeSat software, both on the ground and the spacecraft is built using common IT platforms it is vulnerable to the same kinds of actions that hackers take on regular IT environments. The only difference here is that these CubeSats are in space. Um, so the implications are much more scary. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna use this popular hacker distribution called Kali Linux. This comes pre-built with a lot of tools necessary for conducting uh, the attacks um, and it's freely available. Uh, here on the right-hand side, I have my notes open, so you can follow along. I have uh, arranged these notes as per the, uh, the steps in the attack tree. Um, all right, so let's start with the first step, recon. So in the recon step, I'm going to gather information about the system, the assets, and the users if possible. First objective is to find out the systems to attack. One way to do that uh, is by looking at what systems are registered under the domain name quicksat.com. We use a DNS dumping service for that. It may not give you all the results, but it's a start. So we go to this uh, free uh, domain name dumping service called DNS dumpster and enter your domain name search. And then it would list out, list out all the systems that it knows are registered under that domain. So here we see um, here's an IP address, 159.118.1.204. There are some other systems under, the, uh, under Amazon. Uh, let's focus on this one. Okay, so let's start by probing this IP address 159.1.1.204. As you could see, this IP address is responding. Now we could also probe IP addresses around it as often companies would get allocated a set of contiguous IP addresses. So for example, 202 is alive, uh, 205 is sending, 206 is alive. Now these may not all belong to uh, QuickSight, but at least it's a start. Um, so what so what we have here is um, so let's start with these three IP addresses: 118.202.118.1204.118.1.205. .1 now let's take a look at what services are running on these IP addresses. We'll use a tool called Nmap for this purpose. Uh, so we issue this command called Nmap and run it. Uh, it will map out all these uh, all the ports that are open on the uh, on that on that machine. As we see, there are many many ports open on this machine. I have the final output here uh, for for both these uh, for, for this machine 202, and also similarly you can run it for 205. Basically, what's of interest to us here is that there are three services that we'll focus on. We see that there is port 22, which is the SSH that is open on 202. There's port 84443, which is a web server, and also port 389, which is LDAP or a directory service. Uh, similarly, on 205, there is an SSH and a web server uh, that's open. Now that we know that, now that we know what services are running on the machine, let's try to dig a little bit. The next step is to map out any web applications that are running on this machine. For that purpose, I use this tool called GoBuster, which will actually map out if there are any interesting um, web applications on that machine. So, 
So it uses a dictionary uh, of common words or common applications, and then tries to search that uh, search the this IP address for uh, those applications. It should run pretty quickly. So as we say, it's already giving us uh, some results. So there's something called slash auth, which is running on the server. There's something called slash change password, which exists. Uh, there's info.php, which exists. And now this is interesting. Uh, you see that there's something called PHP my admin that's running. This is a very popular uh, interface for managing uh, databases. And you also have the script called PHP info.php. Um, now, as you can see, this, this is a very interesting script, PHP info. If this is accessible, you click on it, you see that it dumps a ton of information about the server configuration. Um, and this is from a security standpoint, this is really bad. From uh, from hackers point of view, this is, uh, this is a treasure trove of information. So you get everything about what versions of the software is running on the machine to what the key directs are uh, and so on, and what, what's installed, what modules are installed and so on. So this is a really good find. As we see, this, uh, this tool gives us a lot of good information. Uh, but the one that we keep handy is this is this directory, uh, which is the web server root, where all the websites are, are stored. Now let's see if we can extract some information about the user from the servers. Um, as you may recall, uh, when we did our nmap, we found that port 389, which is the LDAP port, was open to the internet. Um, this is a vulnerability and should not be the case. LDAP is a directory protocol which allows organizations to systematically name and manage their assets. Uh, we'll see if we can make LDAP reveal information about the users. We st first try to run this and map command uh, to, uh, to gather information about how the LDAP directory is, is organized. Uh, this could take a while, but this is basically what it returns. It will return you a list of all these, um, all these contexts. So it basically shows how the directory is organized. Now, as you can see, uh, the LDAP is storing a ton of information about servers, about users, about groups. Um, so for us, for, uh, for our interest, we'll query these users. So we could run another command called LDAP search. Uh, to see if we can actually get that information out. So if you run LDAP search, it succeeds, we get a ton of information out. I'm not gonna show you all this information because this is from a real system and there are real users with real accounts. But uh, what's important to note, note here is that uh, this is another vulnerability that we exploited because um, I was able to run this LDAP search without any credentials against this host. From this step, I could gather names and email addresses for two users, Andrew and Aaron. Andrew seems to be someone important at QuickSack and Aaron seems to be a customer. Now the next step is to create the phishing email. I can easily learn about both these users from, the, from their social media, such as LinkedIn and Facebook. Once I do that, I can craft a phishing, uh, convincing phishing email. Here is an example. Note that uh, the link here has a typo, but it is very close to the real site's URL. And also uh, since this email will go out from uh, Andrew, uh, there's very little for Aaron to doubt about this. Now the next step delivery is a really easy part here. I use an online uh, online fake email service uh, such as this to uh, to send an email uh, from Andrew to Aaron. You can play with the headers to make it look uh, as convincing as you want. Um, and as you can see that this is, this is very easy to do. Uh, and let's assume that Aaron falls for this fish and gives me his credentials. Now we move on to the last stage of execution to finally achieve our goal. So at this point, I still don't know where the CubeSat user interface is located. All we have at this point are the user is a username and, and some credentials. So let's see if we can do a little bit more probing. Let's first try remotely logging into the system um, as Aaron. Uh, we could now try probing the system using Aaron's permissions. Uh, oftentimes, system misconfigurations may allow non-privileged users to read information that they should not be able to read. For example, Recall that we had collected this directory uh, uh, about the, uh, the web server uh, in our initial probing. Uh, let's see if we can actually access that directory as Aaron. So if I just paste that directory, it actually allows me to, to go into that directory. And if I see here, I can see the whole, the entire directory structure. Something interesting I find here is another directory called VMS. So if I go into VMS, so sounds interesting. And then, it has something called a login page. So let's see if we can actually um, access that information. So I have it here. So if I click on that, voila, I actually can see uh, what, what looks like a vehicle management system for the CubeSat uh, with the login and a username. Let's try logging in with Adam's credentials and see if that works. Yep. 
just it. Now, once I'm in, I can easily spend some time uh, here trying to get myself familiar with the interface. I've already decided what actions I would um, I, I want to take here. Uh, the easiest way the easiest way to annoy the annoy a user or to create a simple denial of service is to just change some uh, uh, configuration parameters to to confuse the users and and to add delete stuff. Uh, so let's see if we can actually change some parameters here. Um, for example, based on my expression, I found that there is a there's a syslog uh, there's a syslog parameter here. Uh, what it looks like if I set this to a very low value, uh, it will make the CubeSat send say one syslog at a time. Considering that the the CubeSat uh, is in orbit uh, and will only sync once in a while, the user will be able to get only a trickle of status every time uh, it syncs. Finally, another thing I could do here is to just to queue up a ton of commands for the CubeSat to execute. Uh, this will ensure that the CubeSat is locked up processing my commands and perhaps drop the alignment command. So for example, I could just uh, continuously do a bunch of deletes of the same application. Uh, this may not do anything to the CubeSat, but it could just make it execute this command, uh, queue uh, the commands taking up uh, valuable uh, queue space. So as you can see here, um, it's just, it says pending ground, pending ground, pending ground. I've just been queuing up commands for the CubeSat to execute. So next time it, it talks to the database, it's gonna take all of these commands and then execute them. You can easily imagine I could queue up thousands of thousands of commands here. Uh, so just to take a step back, what I've shown here is how easy it was for me to piece together publicly accessible information along with misconfigurations and system vulnerabilities to finally gain access to the CubeSat user interface and cause annoyance to the user. Uh, system owners and operators should take holistic defense in depth approach to system security. Apply cybersecurity best practices, such as firewalling and NS reports, uh, maybe enabling two-factor authentication, patching software, and limiting access to users to defend their assets.